Today, we continue to look at our lives and generosity in terms of defying gravity, defying financial gravity. Reverend Tom Berlin explains that in order to defy gravity, we must, must first acknowledge the pull of financial gravity in each of our lives. There are many things vying for our financial resources, some of which are of God and some of which are of the world. Our job is to stop and listen to where God is leading us and then in fact follow God's lead. Throughout this series, we have looked at what it means to defy the gravitational pull of newer and greater and faster things and what it means to offer our ex- and experience generosity in our lives. This morning, our focus is on simplicity and the value of planning when it comes to both living simply and extending generosity. We'll look at how living a life of simplicity can lead to greater clarity and greater freedom and to live more fully in the moment. Clarity, generosity, and simplicity. Those are our focus for today. Please pray with me. Generous and loving God, Your love and generosity have brought us together. Indeed, it is in your love and through your love that we are sustained each and every day. We pray that you would keep uh, help us keep faithful to you, even when things get stressful, even when things pull at our sides. Lord, help us, strengthen us to deliver your message of hope and grace to all whom we meet. Give us the courage to witness your presence in the world. Amen. Psalm 131 is a very short psalm, just three little verses long. Yet those three little verses poignantly remind us of who God is in our lives and how we are to interact with God. The opening words, O Lord, my heart is not lifted up. Bring to mind those familiar words that we say when we offer, when we do communion. I would lead you first by saying, lift up your hearts. And then after that, the congregation says, we lift them up to the Lord. It's a liturgy that directs our attention, directs our hearts, directs our bodies upward so that we turn away from those things that distract us here on earth. Those things that turn our attention completely toward the worship of God. That's what we do when we turn our hearts up to God. The call to lift up our hearts is a call to prepare our hearts, our minds, and our bodies for worship. The psalmist employs another rich metaphor to describe the state of his soul. Calm and quiet like a weaned child with its mother. The choice of the weaned child over the nursing child in this metaphor is worth noting. The weaned child refers to an older toddler, a young child. The weaned child has experienced some things in the world beyond the safety of that bubble of the mom. They've left the protection of constantly being at that mother's side. The weaned child has learned that such comfort and shelter is not a forever constant. The weaned child has learned that food will not always be so easily provided and that perhaps safety is not always within arm's reach. However, even with this knowledge and this understanding, the weaned child also knows that they may still return to the comfort and the safety of their mother whenever they're in need. It offers us a message of respite, of freedom, and of connection. Psalm 131 could be viewed as a song of innocence. A weaned child may have more experience of the world than a nursing child who has need for neither neither fear nor for hope. However, the psalmist's soul is not impaired by this experience of new life. The psalmist has experienced God's hope alongside all of the world's cruelties. 
The anxiety is suppressed and is therefore free to call on all of Israel to embrace innocence, to have hope in God. We're reminded through this psalm of the value of humility in Christian life, as well as the importance of going to God with our humble, open heart. When we do this, we offer ourselves to God's service, offering ourselves to live our lives according to God's purpose. Showing humility with God allows us to prepare our hearts and our minds to follow God in our actions and in our deeds. Humility reminds us that God is the center of our world and not us. Back in the mid-90s, there was a prominent ad campaign featuring countless celebrities donning iconic milk mustaches. This ad campaign was initially created for the California Milk Processor Board in hopes of encouraging greater consumption of dairy milk. The slogan was, Got Milk. Along with the corresponding campaign accomplished this seemingly insurmountable task of making milk both funny and inviting and something you had to have. George Belch, a San Diego State University marketing professor, said that this advertising was fourfold and is something that I think is used all over. So this ad, first, was simple. It was actionable, something you could do. It was humorous, which is something we remember. And it was integrated. It was everywhere. If you remember, it was on the TVs, it was on the billboards, it was in the grocery stores. Everywhere you looked, you saw got milk. And it stood the test of time. It lasted some two decades being out there. It's not as prominent anymore. They've kind of switched things. But for 20 years, that was their big advertisement. And it was two simple words, got milk. It was something that people could remember. And it was everywhere. And there were, with this phrase, were images of people that we knew with milk mustaches. And there were mouths full of peanut butter and mouths full of cookies right next to that sign that said, Got Milk. Within a few years of this ad campaign being launched, many other entities realized the value of its simplicity and of its memorability. Copycat got X's, got this, got that, started popping up everywhere. Got books, got rice, got coffee, got game, got Jesus. The list went on. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of people who copied this simple ad campaign. Advertisers and organizations latched on to this ad and to this day is considered one of the top parodied advertisement campaigns of all time. And it started with the California Dairy, and it went nationwide. So what does all of this have to do with generosity and stewardship and simplicity? These advertisers found that more words did not necessarily mean better advertisements. In fact, sometimes more words just meant that, more words. The simple two-word advertisement revolutionized the milk industry and possibly even the advertising industry. Simplicity, something that folks can remember. That was the key to the successful, long-running ad campaign. The idea of simplicity in life and the simplicity of resources resonates with the life and the ministry of Jesus as well. In our gospel reading for today, Jesus offers several different nuggets of advice on how to live our lives when we've got God. Jesus offers these nuggets of wisdom to help us defy the pull of financial gravity. And in this passage, we see that Jesus recognizes the problem of too many possessions for this audience in the Bible and the audience still today. Jesus Jesus challenges people to take a position on wealth, which can become a potential threat to God, in that it is also leads people to begin putting more stock in money or putting more stock in God. And all too often, wealth, comp- wealth competes with God in, our, in the human heart. 
consumerism, advertising, can pose serious challenges for contemporary Christians. We're told time and time again that the newer, fancier models will make our lives easier and less stressful. However, for me, that has rarely actually been the case. It is important to take note that Jesus is not calling us to abandon our lives, to give up all of our stuff, to move to a desert and join a monastery, or to empty our savings account and 401k plans. But rather, Jesus is urging us to evaluate, to look at where our money is spent, to look at where our resources are used, and make sure that when we make our choices, we're making our choices with God at the heart of it, that God is central to our decision-making. A life devoted to God is a life lived according to the values of the kingdom of God. The emphasis of this text is upon excessive worrying, excessive anxiety about our needs in our lives. In the, in the text, Jesus asks the ultimate crucial question of faith. Is our allegiance solely to God or is our loyalty divided? True discipleship, someone who desires to be a true follower of Jesus, involves a wholehearted devotion to God. Jesus reminds us that no one can serve two masters. Jesus places this discussion about following and serving God within the context of anxiety and faith and of trust. Do we trust in ourselves? Do we trust in our power? Do we trust in God to guide us? Do we experience anxiety around the needs that we have? Do we trust that God will provide? All of these questions can lead us to what Jesus says when he says, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour of life to your span of life? A simple cliché. They came about from a song released even earlier than those Got Milk ads. was a song that every time I hear it, I think of these verses. I think of this message. Don't worry, be happy. I did a little bit of research on that song and found that the writer, Bobby McFerrin, wrote this song based on a quote that he read on a poster of, I think it's Mare Baba, an Indian spiritual guru, which I found fascinating. And the quote is, do your best, then don't worry, be happy, I will help you. And I thought that the words were so true. And McFerrin later noted that his abbreviated version, don't worry, be happy, is a pretty neat philosophy in just four words. And I would have to agree with that. Those four words sum up a way to follow God and a way to have a life of simplicity, a life where you trust God. When we simply live for and with God, we're also living a life of trust in God. This week I ask you to continue to look at ways that you are called to be a generous steward of all that has been given to you. A couple of weeks ago, we distributed packs of cards, and I have more for those of you who didn't get one. They did come. And in those cards, there's things that you can talk about. And even if you start today instead of two weeks ago, you just keep going, and it'll be four weeks of whether you start today or last week or two weeks ago. So if you don't have them, I invite you to make sure you see me afterwards, and I'll get you a pack of cards. They're just focused on ways to look at your life and how you can simplify some of the things going on in our lives. On Friday, we also mailed out the letters and the estimated giving cards for our stewardship campaign. They should be there Monday or Tuesday. So look those, pray for over those, and we ask you to bring them back next week. There's a spot for you to tell us how much you can commit financially, but there's also space on there to share or ask questions or things that you want to know more about this church. And I invite you to fill out both parts of that. 
and we'll have a time next week during all of our music fun celebration. It will be a good day. So I invite you to pray over those, talk about them, and bring them back next week as well. The information that you put on there helps us to shape our ministry, both through our finances and through what we do. So if there's things that you would like to see happen, that space is for that. So I invite you to do both of those things, please. We are all stewards of what God has given to each of us. What we do with that matters. When we go to God and ask for that advice, that matters. So I ask you to pray. Pray this week for this church. Pray this week for our community. And pray this week for your place in all of that. Amen.